Good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to be here with you. It's especially great after a couple weeks away to, uh, to be back worshiping with you all on this beautiful Sunday. I'm going to start with a brief reading from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Today is a day that Christians around the world um, set aside to, to celebrate Pentecost, the, the day that we read about in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit came into this world and, and entered into the early church and, and empowered them and equipped them and strengthened them to do the work that God had given them to do, the work that God has given us to do. Um, and so we're reminded by the psalmist here that, that even though on Pentecost, that's when the Holy Spirit entered into God's people in a, in a new and powerful way, God's Spirit has always been at work in the world. God's Spirit has always been, been there to make God's presence known. And uh, God's spirit has always been with his people. So that as the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Uh, where can I flee from your presence? Pentecost is, among other things, a reminder that, that God's spirit goes with us. In this world, we have trouble. In this world, there are times where we want to flee. There are times where we want to run and hide. And yet the, the, the promise that we have in scripture is that God's spirit does not leave us to our own devices. God does not abandon us. As we talked about in, in Sunday school this morning and talking about Exodus, God's presence is with us. God's spirit indwells us as Christians, as those who confess the name of Christ. Uh, God's, God's spirit works in us and through us and with us so that we might know him, that we might share him, that we might do the work he's called us to do. And God's spirit animates our worship as well. When we read God's word inspired by God's Holy Spirit, when we, when we come to worship in spirit and in truth, uh, we don't do so on our own. God's spirit uh, is continually present with us. Um, when we pray, uh, as, as Paul says, God's spirit intercedes for us, and, and, or inter God's spirit speaks for us, prays for us with, with words that, uh, that, that we don't even know how to articulate. God is with us. God's spirit is, is in us, and we celebrate that today. So as we come into this place with our struggles, with our burdens, uh, with the challenges we face, we give thanks that uh, God's presence, God's spirit is here, and that in the things we do as we worship in spirit and truth, God will be glorified. Hey, good morning. You're invited to stand, of course. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. And strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong
strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. And strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong. Comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like As I rise, strength of God, go before and lift me up. As I wake, eyes of God, look upon and be my son.
Scripture this morning comes out of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. And afterward, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You may be seated.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we humbly come before you now, keep us grounded. Don't let our minds wander about on what we plan to do later this day or this week. Center us in the here and now as we seek your presence with us. We first come to you this morning to pray for the forgiveness of our sins. We confess we have done wrong and we failed to do good. Like the prodigal son, we are not worthy to be called your children. But you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And for his sake, you forgive us all of our sins. Thanks be to you, O Lord. And now with grateful hearts, we thank you for all our blessings, big and small. And with the psalmist, we give thanks to you and praise your name for the Lord. For you, Lord, are good and your love endures forever. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. We also come to you this morning with our petitions, asking not our will, but yours be done. There are members of our families and friends who seek your blessing of healing. And we give thanks for those who are recovering and those who were healed. We seek your comfort and peace for those experiencing loss of any kind, of loved ones, jobs, homes, broken relationships. And Lord, as we look beyond these walls, we see trouble and strife all around us. We've divided ourselves into tribes. We're hostile to those whose opinions and beliefs we don't share or we don't even try to understand. Trust in our government and religious institutions is being chipped away. We look on at, in horror at all the mass shootings in recent days. Wars continue unabated. Every 48 seconds, someone dies from starvation. We are weighed down by these and other massive problems. We are anxious and fearful. And we know this is not your will for us. We cry out, what can we do? And you answer, with man, this is impossible, but with you, God, all things are possible. You command us to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all of our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So please still our troubled hearts and pour out your Holy Spirit on us to strengthen our faith, and hope in you. Let your radical love move us to do your will, to help where we can, in whatever way we can, to bring healing to our broken world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as a lot of you, some of you know, uh, I just got back from a, a short or a week-long visit uh, out to uh, Yellowstone and uh, Grand Teton National Park. Um, and as much of a crime as I know this is, I'm not exactly uh, the most outdoorsy of a person. Uh, and so while a lot of people would come back from a trip like this or a trip like these uh, and have lots to say about the the wonder and glory of God's creation, and while I do appreciate all that, um, I found myself more grateful for the in-between opportunities, especially around tables. Um, number one, because we hiked a lot more than I'm comfortable with, and I got real hungry. Um, and also because uh, we were visiting with, with family that um, lived, uh, for the most of my life, uh, out in Phoenix and have lived in other areas, uh, so family I don't get to see very often. Uh, and so it was really wonderful to get to spend some time eating and sharing table with uh, this extended family and to even recognize some of the ways that 
what we were doing together in the park shaped what we were doing whenever we came together to eat. Um, to begin with, obviously, it looks like I mentioned, uh, quite hungry and ate some really delicious food. Um, tried my first elk burger. That was a phenomenal experience. Um, highly recommend it. Uh, on top of that, though, uh, we also had the opportunity to, because we were in two different uh, vehicles driving around the park, um, we got to catch up with different people at different times, depending on who was in, you know, what vehicle. Um, but it also led to uh, certain vehicles uh, would see, you know, would see one thing or would see one animal or see one thing that the other didn't. And so whenever we came around the table um, in the evening to, sh to share a meal, we would get to share, hey, did you see that, you know, did you see that uh, pack of bison? Did you see those wolf pups? Which I didn't. I was really bummed that that would have been really cool. Uh, but the other car saw the wolf pups. Um, and, on, and, and the third thing, I guess, was uh, some, at some point in our meal, we would also um, begin to plan out the next day, given what we saw that, given what we saw one day. So, you know, we saw, oh, we saw, you know, Old Faithful today. Well, we, we saw some geysers today. What are we going to do tomorrow? What, what about today is going to shape what we're going to do tomorrow? And we solved all this at the table. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this is really the time where, uh, you know, we experience and we see all these all these wonderful things, but uh, it's at the table and it's with each other that we come together to you know collaborate and uh, to bring our ideas together and to and to decide what our life is going to look like um, going forward. And I think that's a really really fitting um, way to look at the table here. Um, we come number one because we're hungry. Um, we're hungry for for the spirit of God, which we experience here at this table. We come because we bring things that others might not have seen, and we can point to other things, and we bring together and collaborate when we come to this table. And finally, our lives are certainly different after we leave it. We, whenever we come together, when we gather here to worship and we come to the table, we decide to live lives that are different because of what we experience at the table. And so I think those uh, are three, you know, sort of, things to hang on to uh, whenever you think about um, coming together, gathering in to come to the table um, from whether it's in, you know, in the middle of a national park or, or from daily life. So uh, um, come taste and see that the Lord is good. Savior, I know for sure. 
now as we prepare to gather at the table, let's go to God in prayer. God, we do give you thanks for all the ways that you guide us, for all the ways that you draw us into your presence, for all the ways you reveal yourself to us. Lord, whether it's in the beauty of your creation, whether it's in uh, the words of scripture, whether it's in the, the people that we worship alongside and serve alongside, we see glimpses of you, glimpses of your grace, glimpses of your goodness in ways that sustain us and encourage us and, and nourish us. And God, we thank you that when your son Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, when he knew that, that his time on earth with his followers was coming to an end, He left them with this table. He left us with this table. God, we thank you that as we gather here, as we eat, as we drink, as we remember, you are present with us. And so God, as we take this bread and as we take this cup, may we be mindful of your love, your fathomless love, your indescribable love that is at work in this world, that's at work in our lives and that shapes us and, and makes us new each day. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. that Jesus was betrayed. He took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. same way he took the cup. He gave thanks, he poured it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. pray, God, that as we take these, as we remember, you would use these gifts to sustain us and nourish us and make us more into the people and servants you've called us to be. It's in your son's name we pray these things.
bring to you these gifts or this small portion of what you have blessed us with. We pray, God, that you would receive what we have to give, that you would use it for your kingdom, that you would use it to, to spread the good news of your gospel, Lord, here and, and also around the world. God, help us to, in some small part, play a role in, in your kingdom. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. As the kids head downstairs for Children's Church, we're going to turn to a passage of scripture that's found in Acts chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 41. Let's listen to God's word together. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation on, under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, 
nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, all for, whom, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for this story of Pentecost, the story of a moment when your disciples received your spirit and began in unexpected and amazing ways to change the world. God, we thank you that your spirit still moves, that, that your word still speaks. And we pray, God, that as we receive your word today, you would shape us, you would form us into the people, the church, uh, the messengers, the servants that you've called us to be. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. As most of you all probably know, over the past couple of weeks, uh, Lisa and I had the chance to travel with a student group from Milligan. We got to go to several places in Europe. Some of the things that we got to see over the last couple of weeks were incredible. Some of the experiences that we got to have alongside our students will stick with us for a long time. Now, I am not an expert on world travel by any means, but over the years, I have picked up on some surefire ways to stick out in a strange place some telltale signs that let the locals know that we're from somewhere else. Sometimes it's more subtle things, like how we dress, or how we order our coffee, or what we eat for breakfast. Sometimes it's the dumbstruck look that we wear on our faces as we wander the streets of a new city, stopping every so often to pull out a map and kind of orient ourselves to our surroundings. But of course, we, we never stand out more in a foreign country than when we open our mouths to speak. Nothing can make us feel more lost, more vulnerable, or more exposed than an inability to speak the language. If I were a better traveler, if I were a more sophisticated citizen of the world, I would devote myself to the hard work of learning fluency in the languages of the places that I like to explore. As it is, my communication is pretty faltering most of the time enough to order a croissant or a coffee, enough to say I'm sorry if I bump into someone on the street, which happens a lot, or to offer thanks when I buy something from a store. But my language isn't anywhere near the level needed to express or discuss anything beyond the most superficial things, let alone to talk about the deeper meanings at the heart of what I might be experiencing in any given moment. And so this inability to communicate can be isolating and at times, it can even be a little bit scary. When it comes to this sort of communication gap, when it comes to this sort of vulnerability, this feeling of being overwhelmed by difficulty, at being unable to say exactly what we want to say, the original followers of Jesus might be able to sympathize. According to what we learn about them in the scriptures, the New Testament disciples weren't particularly well-educated, at least most of them weren't. Certainly, they weren't sophisticated. Many of them were fishermen, roughnecks mostly, peasants from small backwaters scattered around the Sea of Galilee, people who had spent the most formative years of their lives sleeping under the stars, 
dodging the authorities, living off of the kindness and charity of others as they followed Jesus through the towns and villages that he, where he taught. And yet, as they said goodbye to their rabbi, Jesus, as he enlisted them in a work that would consume their lives, a few things became abundantly clear. First, they had learned so much and they had grown so much more than they could ever realize. And second, they would continue to learn so much and grow so much more than they could even imagine. When Jesus left the disciples to return to the Father, he gave them a pretty tall order to fill, a pretty important and frankly scary mission to complete. They were to carry the good news of his kingdom, not just close to home, but in far places, far-flung lands, out beyond what is comfortable. Specifically, in Acts chapter 1, just before he ascended to heaven, Jesus told his disciples that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think it's that last bit that would have been somewhat terrifying, to the ends of the earth. The questions that the disciples must have wrestled with in the face of this challenge were probably pretty daunting. But even before that, they had to face one of the greatest challenges— They had to do one of the most difficult things of all. They had to wait. Jesus had told them to wait for the gift the Father had promised, to wait in anticipation for the power that the Father would give them. And that's where we find them at the opening of Acts chapter 2. They're in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is a familiar place to them, even if it's not always a welcoming place for them. Jerusalem is where just... A few weeks earlier, they had watched their teacher and Lord get arrested. It's a place where they watched him be crucified. It's a place where they had huddled in an upper room out of fear. But Jerusalem is also the place where Jesus had passed through locked doors to greet them from beyond the grave, to show them his scars, to speak words of peace and comfort, and to bring them into a new and unexpected story. Here in Acts 2, The disciples are doing what Jesus told them to do. They're waiting. They're waiting for the gift that Jesus had promised. They're waiting for the feast of Pentecost to begin. They're waiting for thousands upon thousands of visitors from all over the world, children of Abraham from Africa, Asia, and Europe, to make their way to the holy city. They're waiting for whatever might come next, and they're hoping that whatever it was that might be coming their way, they'd be up for it. And in the midst of all of this waiting, God acted. God burst onto the scene in one of the most dramatic ways we could ever imagine. There was fire. There was wind. Luke describes it as a violent wind, even. There was the unmistakable and inescapable realization that something was taking place that was so much bigger than these simple followers of Jesus gathered in that room. Yet it was something that wouldn't quite have been the same without them. After the resurrection, Jesus had walked through those doors into the upper room to let his disciples know that everything was changed. And now, on Pentecost, those same disciples walked out the doors of an upper room, out into the streets of Jerusalem, intent on letting anyone and everyone with ears to hear know that God was working. But this was no small feat. The streets were full of pilgrims from every country, moving through the hustle and bustle with the excitement of the feast. They were likely speaking and gesturing to one another, loudly and demonstrably. A couple of times over the past few weeks, on a busy corner in Florence or at a chaotic intersection in Rome, I've been a little overwhelmed by all the activity, all the excitement, all of the talking, very little of which I'm able to understand. And in those moments, my best course of action was just to try to kind of weave through the crowds and make it to where I need to go. If I had been charged in those moments with stepping into that crowd with a message that they needed to hear, I have to admit that I'd be pretty out of my depth. I don't doubt that Peter, James, and John, and the rest all might have felt the same way. The thought of stepping into the midst of a bustling throng and trying to articulate directions to the nearest restaurant would be an intimidating proposition. But to be able to step into a crowd like that and speak the mystery of God's heart for humanity, the salvation of the lost, God's reconciliation of all things, 
That would seem like an impossibility. But with God, impossibilities become realities. When God's Holy Spirit moves, the unthinkable becomes unavoidable. And so there they are, these unlettered fishermen, these misfits, these faithful believers thrust onto a grand stage. And they began to speak with power the words that God had given them in languages that this massive crowd could understand. It's hard to know what this looked like exactly. We get sort of an overview in the book of Acts, but it's hard to know all the details. The list of ethnic groups and languages represented there in Jerusalem is dizzying. We read about the Medes, the Parthians, the Elamites, the Asians, Egyptians, Cretans, Arabs, and others. And yet they're all able to hear what the disciples are saying. Maybe Peter was speaking Greek and John translated into Arabic and James shared the message in a Parthian dialect. We don't really know. The Spirit's work is mysterious, but in this case, it's undeniably effective. The word is proclaimed. God's good news is heard. That's not to say that everyone who heard the disciples immediately jumped on board. The initial reviews of this first Pentecost sermon were decidedly mixed. As Luke, the author of Acts, tells it, the first response was puzzlement, and the second response was derision. Some ask, what does this all mean? Others laughed at the disciples and accused them of being drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's at this point, I think, that the real miracle of Pentecost occurs. To me, the wonder of what happened on that day is not just about the fire or the wind or the different dialects, although all of those things are amazing. It's also about the boldness, the courage, the conviction with which God's messengers were able to deliver their message. Just a few weeks earlier, Peter had stood around a small bonfire in the temple courts, and he had denied with curses and cowardice that he even knew Jesus. But now this same Peter, this same Galilean fisherman who had run for cover when the heat was on, stands in front of this massive crowd. And he faces their challenges with confidence. He answers their questions with clarity. Just a few weeks ago, almost all of these followers of Jesus scattered and ran like frightened sheep when their rabbi was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now they're standing up strong and speaking about things of ultimate importance. Not just to a few close and trusted confidants. No, they're speaking to a potentially hostile audience from all over the world. This isn't a display of drunkenness, Peter says. It's the work of God. Just as the prophets foretold, just as hundreds of years ago, the prophet Joel talked about the coming of the day of the Lord. Around the time that our ancestors were returning from their long exile in Babylon, he says, Joel pointed to signs that would be even more impressive, even more vexing, even more world-changing than anything that any of those gathered in Jerusalem had ever witnessed. The moon would turn blood red, the the sun would go dark, fire and billows of smoke would mark God's presence. Visions and prophecies would spread throughout God's people, young and old, men and women, all revealing that God was at work, fulfilling his promises and enacting his purposes, not just in Jerusalem, but to the ends of the earth. And what's at the heart of these promises and purposes? Or should I say, who is at the heart of these promises and purposes? Peter quotes Joel, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That much they knew, or at least they should have known. That's why they were in Jerusalem in the first place, to call on the name of the Lord, to trust the, the God of their fathers and mothers to save them from the things that oppress them, from the things that burden them, from the things that threaten to crush them. But then Peter goes on to tell a different story, and maybe this is one that they weren't prepared for, but it's certainly a story they'd heard about. It's the story of Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was handed over to the authorities, the one who was put to death by nailing him to a cross, the one who was cruelly shamed and brutally executed just outside the gates of the city where they now stood, within a stone's throw of the temple courts where they had come to worship. As Peter spoke, and as the other disciples translated, the, the, the story of a carpenter's son from Galilee who was bigger than death the story of one who was more powerful than the forces of sin and darkness, this story began to take shape. It started to become clear that when Peter, 
this same Peter who had denied knowing Jesus when the chips were down, when he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, he's talking about none other than Jesus, the man who died a criminal's death, but who has been revealed by the power of God to be the Lord and Messiah. If the people were a little dumbfounded and dismissive when the disciples started speaking in foreign tongues, if they were tempted to reject the message when Peter first began his sermon, things started to turn by the time Peter's message reached its climax. Luke uses such a great phrase here. He says that the people were cut to the heart, and they ask, what shall we do? And here, Peter's message was the same as Jesus' message had been way back when he started traveling through the towns and villages of Nazareth throughout Galilee to proclaim the truth of the kingdom. It's a message of repentance. Repent, he says. He moves on to embrace God's work in baptism. Repent and be baptized. And it, it it concludes with God's promises, forgiveness, the gift of the Spirit, new and abundant life. Promises that Peter says are available to those who are far off just as much to those who are near. And on that day, 3,000 people responded. They received this word with joy. They stepped into this new life in hope that what God was doing through Jesus would change their lives. And beyond that, what God was doing through Jesus would change the world. 2,000 years later, it's tough for us not to feel sometimes like We're standing in the midst of a crowd, in the midst of a culture, in the midst of a world that speaks a different language from us, a thousand different languages from us, the language of power, the language of pleasure, the language of self-interest, the language of greed, the language of ambition, the language of hopelessness, the language of death. And yet, as scary as this can be, as overwhelmed and as vulnerable as we in the church might sometimes feel when we look around and we wonder how we might ever speak a word of love, a word of grace, a word of life, a word of truth, in a way that might take root in the hearts and minds of those around us, those whom God created, those whom God loves, those whom God is working to reconcile to himself. Now, just as then, we're not doing this on our own. As with the disciples, when we are weak, God is strong. When we are faltering, God is confident. When we don't have the words to say, when we struggle to articulate the good news we've been given, God is there. Our message is the same one as Peter spoke that day. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The person at the heart of that message, Jesus, our Lord, our Messiah, has not changed. We still have a word for those who are near and a word for those who are far off. The hope that is found in Jesus is still a hope that conquers death. The love that is embodied in Jesus is still a love that is greater than all of our sin. And we are still called to be his witnesses in Irwin, in Tennessee, and into the ends of the earth. In word and in deed, in the languages that God gives us to speak, may we bear witness to God's promises and God's purposes. May we share God's love and God's truth with a world that so desperately needs to hear. Let's pray. God, we thank you that 2,000 years ago, you began a work through those disciples, through their receiving of the Holy Spirit, through their proclamation of the gospel. Lord, you began a work that continued until it drew in the Gentiles, it drew in the nations, until it drew us in. And God, it's a work that still continues. We're thankful for that. We're thankful that in some small way, we get to play a part in this work that you're doing, this work of of renewal, reconciliation, forgiveness, salvation, hope. And God, we pray that just as those disciples did on that first day of Pentecost, Lord, that we would step into this work, that you would equip us, encourage us, strengthen us, and help us to know that we are not alone. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. So on that, on that day when Peter stood in front of that crowd and, and he spoke the story of Jesus, he told the story of Jesus, uh, the people responded with a question, what shall we do? And Peter responded with a call. It was essentially the same call he had received, repent, follow Jesus, confess him, be baptized into him. It's a call that, that 
millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people throughout the centuries have responded to in one way or another. And it's a call that still exists for us today to, to come to, to Christ, to, to embrace his kingdom, and to begin walking in this life that he holds out for us. And so we set aside time each week to respond to that call. If you haven't done that in your life, if you haven't confessed the name of Christ, been baptized into him, begun walking in, in the way that he lays out for us, this is, this is a time when, when you can do that. It's also a time when, uh, for those of you who have made that decision, but you, you, you know, as, as we all do, that, that we need others to walk alongside. If you want to join us here at First Christian, you can do that as well. Um, and then finally, it's just time for those who need prayer. Uh, we would love to, to pray with you. Um, and, and if any of this is tough to do in front of a group of people, please talk to somebody before you leave today. Let us pray with you, let us pray for you, and let us see what God is doing in your life. But now as the worship team sings, let's stand and join them. And if you have a decision to make, please come forward. Once again, it's been a blessing to get to worship with you all today, both those who are here in the sanctuary and also those who are worshiping with us at home. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to close in prayer, but uh, before I do, just a couple of announcements about some things coming up. Um, as has been mentioned, um, you know, our summer schedule is going to be a little bit different than what we do during the school year. We'll have some different activities and, and things to, uh, to take part in, and, and that starts today. So um, this afternoon at um, 1 o'clock uh, or thereabouts, um, at Kiwanis Park in Johnson City. Um, some, some people from church are just going to kind of be gathering for, for a picnic. You can bring your lunch, um, hang out together, uh, enjoy this beautiful afternoon, um, eat lunch together. Uh, kids, will, kids will be able to play. Adults will be able to play as well. And just uh, a good time to, to be together this afternoon. And then at 3 o'clock today um, at the Johnson City AMC Theaters, 
um, we have an opportunity to, to, to go see a movie together. The, uh, it's, it's free of charge. It's um, the skit guys who um, some of you have, have seen their skits before. They've, they've uh, done stuff at the Tennessee Christian Teen Convention. We've watched some videos, I think, at our Carol Sing and some other, some other gatherings that we've had. Um, they have a movie called Family Camp. And um, it's, again, just going to be a great opportunity for us to kind of experience that together, enjoy that together. So that's going to be at 3 o'clock um, at the Johnson City AMC. There's um, plenty of room both at the park and the theater for, for everyone. So um, join us if you can. Uh, 1 o'clock at Kiwanis Park in Johnson City and then 3 o'clock at Johnson City AMC theaters for the movie. Um, and then on Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday evening at 6.30, um, we're going to gather out back around the campfire, uh, the fire pit, and um, just have some time uh, for, for worship together. Um, are we eating together, Andy? Do you know? Okay. Okay. Uh, we may have hot dogs or something. We'll, we'll put that announcement in the broadcaster this week. Uh, but we are having a campfire together, worship together um, at 630 out, in the, out, out at the fire pit uh, out behind the church. So join us Wednesday evening, 630 for that as well. Um, and if you haven't seen one of these schedules, uh, be on the lookout for one. We may have some today, and if not, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be distributing them. So uh, this gives you a sense of kind of what's coming up throughout, uh, throughout the, the next couple of months as we have some, some fun summer activities. Um, any other announcements? All right, well, let's close in prayer. God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day, for this chance to be together, and now, Lord, for this chance to go out, to go out into a world that just as just as much as, as the world 2,000 years ago needed to hear the message of your son Jesus, uh, this Jesus who was crucified, who is Lord and Messiah. Uh, God, help us to, to go out with that message as well with our, in our words, in our actions, in all that we do and say, may we point to him. And in doing so, Lord, may we point to, to your kingdom and, and draw others into fellowship with you. It's in the name of your son Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit that we pray these things. Amen. Go in peace.